A lively protest tonight in Providence as hundreds of folks showed up to voice their opposition to that proposed downtown Paw Sox Stadium. The protest was held on the spot where the new owners want to build their new park on a huge chunk of 195 land. Protesters we spoke with say they are completely against the idea of building the stadium in Providence and are not happy that taxpayer money could be used to get the deal done. This is regurgitating good money after bad. This is something our state is just great on. They want to go to Victory Place? They want to pay for it? Perfect. That's a perfect spot for it. Not here. No how. It's not going to generate new jobs for this state. Uh, it's a net zero gain in jobs. It's not going to generate new business for Providence. People will come to the stadium. They'll spend money in the stadium. They'll spend money on parking, and then they'll go home. On Friday, Paw Sox owner Larry Lucchino said he remains focused on negotiating a deal to build the new stadium on the old 195 land. Earlier in the month, Speaker Mattiello said it's unlikely that a pitch for the stadium project will be considered by lawmakers until the next session kicks off early next year. The building is quite full of uh, automobiles, motorcycles. Um, with the building being a metal building, when we arrived, the building was already starting to be compromised. So we did not enter the building at all. So we're a uh, fully defensive attack on the fire.
Thank you for the invitation, Jorge Alorza. Thank you for the invitation. This is a much better premiere for us because an L.A. premiere is an industry premiere and people are sort of like judging and they're also thinking, I have a movie coming out at the same time, I hope this isn't really good. You know, so you get a lot of that and here it's just friends who love us and, and who we love and everybody out to have a good time. Thank you very much. It's a long way down from atop a 40-foot ladder, but it's no big deal for these recruits. Three North Kingstown fire hopefuls joined 13 from Warwick in their 12th week of training to become firefighters. The primary thing has been team building. Um, just pretty much everything ties back into that. And this fall, firefighters in Warwick will have a slightly different looking team to trust in. Jenny Sales and Stephanie Gonzalez are training to join the boys, the first female recruits Warwick has seen in more than two decades. I'm, you know, very grateful for the opportunity and it's really humbling. Though both ladies ended up at this training session, they say their experiences when choosing the fire service were very different. Sales, a former PE teacher, says she's always been part of a team on the sports field, in the classroom, and now in the fire service. And for Gonzalez, it's been a dream since her senior year of high school. I get to go with the rescue in town and absolutely fell in love with it. The guy I was working with was a captain and it's like his passion towards what his job was, it just it made me want to definitely go for it. The women say training has been tough for everyone. There's no gender separation when it comes to preparing for a job as a firefighter. We spend over 60 hours a week together and so we're all like, like I said, basically a family now. We are like one of the guys here so it's like we got to keep up with them as much as they got to keep up with us. The 18 week training program will wrap up with graduation on September 10th. In Warwick, Nicole Brazier, ABC6 News. In some science classes, you do homework. In others, you do experiments. In this science class, they decided to build this electric car. Zipping along the Tiverton High School track at its top speed of 18 miles an hour, you would have never guessed that just a few months ago, this electric vehicle was a pile of PVC pipes and batteries. When we uh, got the plans originally, and you look at the book, and it was like a 30-page book of just the design of the frame, and it was a little overwhelming at first. Senior Zachary Silvera, along with fellow student Ryan Murka, built the car as part of an independent study. In addition to the pipes, the car features wheels originally from bicycles, three batteries, and this convenient connection that plugs into a standard outlet for charging. It was very exciting to see something you've worked hard on for four months be able to work and not fall apart on a track. 
While the car is obviously not designed to cruise up and down I-95, it is something that could be potentially used in a retirement living community. It costs about $1,000 to build, and their teacher, Ed Fernandes, estimates it costs less than a penny a mile to drive. It's the perfect lesson in energy efficiency. So these types of projects really are preparing the next, this and the next generation of thinkers and innovators to change the world, to make it a better place. And the next potential step for this project would be to put in a battery system that charges itself while you drive. I'm meteorologist Pete Mangione, Eyewitness News. Ever dream of being a rock and roller and getting up on the big stage? You get to play with your heroes. How much cooler is that? I'm Doreen Scanlon. I'll take you inside Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp on ABC6 News. Tonight at 11. By day, Chuck Argenti runs an auto body shop. But by night... He's a rock and roller who jams on stage with Roger Daltrey from The Who. So how does a 53-year-old guy from Pawtucket end up playing with a rock and roll Hall of Famer? The answer? It's what he did at Strummer Camp. This is Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Over four days at Foxwoods, these wannabe rock stars play their hearts out and learn a thing from their camp counselors who just happen to be veterans of the stage. Some who've had number ones like Johnny A and Gary Hoey, famous for his cover of Hocus Pocus. He's the music director. So basically they have, we have four days to groom them in how to rehearse, how to get ready for the show, teach them a few stage moves, and it's amazing for us because we get to see the excitement that they have as musicians. Agenti's counselor is Rick Derringer, as in... It's like a dream come true, you know. I saw Rick Derringer at the Roseland Ballroom in Taunton, Mass, back in like 1978. We thought he was the coolest guy then, you know. We all wanted to play like Rick Derringer. And now he's playing with Derringer. And they didn't just play together, they bonded over their love of music. Absolutely beautiful. I'm hoping that I'll be able to help them. Really, that's the bottom line. Hotel rooms are converted into jam rooms. Out with the beds and dressers, drums, keyboards, and amps fill the floor instead. People of all ages, 12 on up, come from all over the world to learn from these pros. So whether you're a casual player or yeah, really know how to let it rip, anyone is welcome at camp. Shelling out $5,000 on up for the opportunity. You get to play with your heroes. How much cooler is that? One of those rock legends, Roger Daltrey, sang with each band. <laughs> helping them with their performances. It's always fun. And I do this because it, it does, like I said, it, it reminds me of why I became a rock singer in the first place because this was the most fun thing I could think of ever doing. <laughs> And it, this brings you back home. It's the big finale, a concert in Foxwoods Grand Theater. The excitement builds, the theater fills, a last minute sound check, a quick tune up, lights up, showtime. An exhilarating turn at the mic for Argenti to end Fantasy Camp, which he's planning on making his reality. It's more or less what I want the rest of my life to be. Doreen Scanlon, ABC6 News. The wings are sizzling at Boneyard Barbecue and Saloon in Seacon. Once again, the owners are supporting the annual wing fling event benefiting local law enforcement. It's now in its sixth year, and every year the Boneyard Barbecue and Saloon has taken part. It's a great cause. They raise a lot of money, and um, hey, I'm glad they sell it every year now. The wing fling began as a way to help an Attleboro police officer named Rich Barabee who broke his neck. His brothers in the FOP wanted to raise money to help cover expenses outside of insurance. It's been wildly successful. It's a great chance for everybody to come out, support law enforcement, and support some great restaurants and get some amazing wings. Oh, yes, the wings. Part of the fun includes celebrity judges tasting all kinds of wings from gourmet to hot. And by hot, I mean something between volcanic and center of the sun. I would know. 
Last year, I was a judge in Boneyard Barbecue created the winner. It's hot. I literally was crying. Well, um, like I said. A sadistic streak in you, is that what it is? <laughs> Absolutely not. I couldn't, I don't eat them, that's all I know. They're too hot for me, but people love them, and I'm, I'm just glad we won. One of the many restaurants looking to take down Boneyard and claim the honor of best tasting and hottest wings, Casey's Classic Burger Bar in North Attleboro. We're using a Thai bird chili for our hot wing, something you don't see in this area too often. And then a little pineapple soy kind of flavor for our gourmet wing. The rest of the secret. Wings up. From tackles oh, it, to touchdowns, high school football is back. And just a few weeks into the season, there are already players sidelined with injuries. Two weeks ago at practice, I went head-to-head -head with one of my teammates. And then after that, I had a bad headache that night and I had to go to the emergency room and I was diagnosed with a concussion. Getting hurt is part of the game. There's a risk going out there, but you've got to know the risks. But coaches like John George at East Greenwich High School are working to prevent them as much as possible, starting with equipment. The best helmet is the helmet that fits the best. They aren't one size fits all. What we've started doing is ordering, when we get new helmets in every year, we order the same company but a different style. Making sure the players pick the right one for their head shape and size. Then there's the skill set, learning the heads up program. Teach them how not to tackle with your head, keep your head out of it, and, uh, and just work technique. The Rhode Island Interscholastic League limits full contact at practice to no more than 30 minutes in a day, 90 in a week. We don't hit each other in practice. We're, we're not a big school. We don't have 100 kids on the team, so we can't afford to beat ourselves up in practice. We practice hard and fast, but we don't knock heads. And it's helped. In the last few years, we've had less and less. I would, I would say below five. But still, they happen. I know that every game I have a chance of getting badly injured, but I love it. So as Owen Haynes recovers from his concussion, he's following a particular protocol. The most dangerous thing about a concussion is if you get one and you continue to play and you come back too soon. Trainers are tracking his progress, utilizing a baseline test the players at East Greenwich High take the first week of camp. Using that data, the injured player works back up to full contact and eventually back in the game. It's a process that helps ease fears of parents. I understand completely people are afraid of concussions, but uh, I for one am not. I think uh, if you're in the right circumstance, you learn to play correctly, you'll just be, you'll be fine. That's part of life, is teaching them how to take educated risks. And hoping the reward is much greater. For your health, I'm Doreen Scanlon, ABC 6 News.